Hello everyone and welcome. Today we'll be diving into the essential aspects of caring for patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus. I'm excited to share this information with you. Our objectives for this session are comprehensive. We'll compare the characteristics of type 1 diabetes, discuss critical nursing interventions, review insulin types, develop a teaching plan, address patient and family needs, and explore ethical challenges. Diabetes mellitus is an endocrine disorder characterized by a lack of insulin, leading to impaired carbohydrate metabolism and, ultimately, hyperglycemia. Understanding this basic definition is crucial. The endocrine system is like the body's messaging network, and insulin is one of its key messengers. Without enough insulin, sugar stays trapped in the blood instead of entering cells where it can be used for energy. Hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar, becomes toxic over time, damaging organs from the inside out. It's this slow but dangerous process that makes early diagnosis and treatment so important. Glucose is the primary fuel for the central nervous system. The brain requires a constant supply as it cannot store insulin. When glucose is unavailable, the body can utilize fatty acids for energy. Think of glucose like electricity for the brain. It's vital and the supply must be steady. Unlike muscles or the liver, the brain cannot store energy reserves. If glucose drops too low, brain cells struggle to function, leading to confusion, seizures, or even coma. When glucose is absent, the body burns fats instead, but this creates acids called ketones, which can quickly become dangerous if they accumulate. Let's take a look at the key players in glucose homeostasis, the stomach, duodenum, and especially the pancreas. The pancreas, with its eyelids of Langerhans, is responsible for producing insulin and glucagon. The stomach and small intestine, specifically the duodenum, help sense nutrients entering the body. But the pancreas is the true star of the show. Inside the pancreas, specialized areas called the eyelids of Langerhans act like tiny chemical factories, releasing insulin to lower blood sugar and glucagon to raise it. Maintaining balance between these hormones is what keeps blood sugar stable, whether you're eating, exercising, or resting. Insulin and glucagon are the hormones that tightly regulate blood glucose levels. Insulin lowers blood glucose by allowing cells to take it up, while glucagon raises blood glucose by stimulating the liver to release stored glucose. Think of insulin as the key that unlocks the door for glucose to enter cells. Without insulin, glucose remains in the bloodstream, leading to hyperglycemia. Imagine your cells are houses, and glucose is a delivery truck carrying energy. Insulin is the key that unlocks the front door. Without the key, the truck just sits outside, causing traffic jams, high blood sugar, while the people inside starve. Over time, these traffic jams cause damage to blood vessels, nerves, kidneys, eyes, and the heart, explaining why long-term diabetes control is so important. There are several types of diabetes, including type 1, type 2, gestational diabetes, and other less common forms. Each type has its own unique characteristics and management strategies. For instance, type 2 diabetes often relates to lifestyle and insulin resistance, while type 1 is autoimmune and usually diagnosed early in life. Gestational diabetes occurs during pregnancy and, if unmanaged, can affect both mother and baby. Knowing the differences is critical for creating effective care plans. Type 1 diabetes is typically an autoimmune disease where the body attacks and destroys the insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas. Genetic factors, viral exposure, and low vitamin D levels may play a role. Hyperglycemia in type 1 diabetes leads to a range of symptoms. These include polydipsia, polyphagia, lethargy, weight loss, blurred vision, kusmal breathing, and polyuria. These symptoms aren't random. They're the body's desperate attempt to manage the energy crisis. Excess thirst and urination are ways the body tries to flush out the extra sugar. 
rapid breathing is an effort to correct the acid imbalance caused by ketones. Diagnosing diabetes involves assessing blood plasma glucose levels. We'll look at fasting, non-fasting, and hemoglobin A1c levels to understand the diagnostic criteria. Diagnosing diabetes early allows intervention before serious damage occurs. Each type of blood test gives us a different snapshot. Fasting tests the baseline, non-fasting captures random spikes, and A1c reflects the long-term average. Fasting plasma glucose levels are a key indicator. A normal level is less than 100 mmol DL. A level of 126 mmol DL or higher on two separate tests is diagnostic of diabetes. Fasting glucose shows how the body manages sugar without recent food intake. Elevated fasting sugar points to chronic problems with insulin production or action. Non-fasting or random plasma glucose levels also provide valuable information. A level of 200 mmol DL or higher, along with symptoms, is diagnostic of diabetes. This test is useful because symptoms often appear during the day, not just in fasting states. If a random blood sugar spikes to 200 mg DL or more, especially if the patient is experiencing thirst, urination, or blurred vision, it's a strong sign of uncontrolled diabetes. Here's a quick comparison of fasting and non-fasting blood glucose levels and their corresponding diagnoses. This helps to differentiate between normal, prediabetes, and diabetes. Prediabetes is the warning zone where interventions like diet and exercise might reverse the trend. Catching patients in this stage could prevent full-blown diabetes and spare them from complications later on. Hemoglobin A1c reflects average blood glucose levels over the past two, three months. A normal A1c is between four to six percent. An A1c of 6.5 percent or higher indicates diabetes. This chart illustrates the correlation between A1c levels and average blood glucose levels. It also highlights the ADA and AC goals for A1c management. The honeymoon period in type 1 diabetes is a temporary phase after diagnosis where the patient requires very little insulin. This can last up to a year, but it's important to remember it's temporary. During this time, the remaining beta cells still produce a little insulin. Patients may feel better and even question their diagnosis, but it's critical to continue treatment because the underlying autoimmune destruction is ongoing. Effective diabetes treatment involves a multifaceted approach. This includes nutritional management, education, exercise, pharmacologic therapy, and consistent monitoring. The goals of therapy are to maintain A1C levels at 7.0% or below preprandial blood glucose between 70 130 mg on DL and peak postprandial blood glucose below 180 mg on DL. Glucose monitoring is essential for managing diabetes. Patient education on proper technique, equipment sharing, and understanding results is crucial. Proper technique includes cleaning hands before testing and using a fresh lancet each time. Patients must be taught to interpret trends, not just individual numbers, to make smarter decisions about insulin, food, and activity. Continuous glucose monitors CGMs offer real-time glucose data. These devices use a sensor worn on the skin and can indicate trends in glucose levels. CGMs are revolutionary because they give patients and providers a bigger picture of glucose patterns, not just a few isolated finger sticks a day. They can alert patients to dangerous highs or lows before they become emergencies, improving safety and overall quality of life. Insulin is always required for type 1 diabetes. There are different types of insulin, each with its own onset, peak, and duration of action. Since the body can no longer make insulin at all, patients must supply it from external sources, knowing when an insulin type starts to work, when it's strongest, and how long it lasts helps nurses tailor insulin timing to meals, exercise, and daily routines.
This table provides a detailed overview of different insulin types, including rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting, along with their onset, peak, and duration. This graph visually represents the duration of action for different types of insulin. Understanding these profiles is key to effective insulin management. A visual curve helps connect the science to real life. If you give a patient rapid-acting insulin but they skip lunch, they're at high risk for hypoglycemia because their insulin will still be working hard without glucose available. When administering insulin injections, it's important to rotate injection sites to prevent complications. These diagrams show potential injection sites on the body. Rotating sites avoids repeated trauma to the same tissue, which can lead to poor absorption and uneven blood sugar control. Preferred areas include the abdomen, thighs, back of the arms, and buttocks, and each site must be rotated systematically. Complications of insulin injections can include lipoatrophy and lipohypertrophy. Rotating injection sites helps to minimize these issues. An alternative method of insulin administration is continuous subcutaneous infusion using an insulin pump. This provides a steady controlled dose of insulin. Hypoglycemia or low blood glucose is a common complication of insulin therapy. It's defined as a blood glucose level below 70 millibolismer DL. Hypoglycemia can strike fast and be deadly if not addressed promptly. It's one of the biggest risks for patients on insulin, especially if meals are skipped, doses are miscalculated, or exercise isn't balanced with food intake. Hypoglycemia can be caused by taking too much insulin, not eating enough, excessive exercise, or alcohol consumption. Early symptoms of hypoglycemia include tremors, diaphoresis, tachycardia, and weakness. Late symptoms can include confusion, seizures, and coma. Remember, hypoglycemia can occur suddenly. It's important to recognize the symptoms and take prompt action to raise blood glucose levels. Treatment for mild hypoglycemia involves consuming 15 grams of fast-acting carbohydrates, such as glucose tablets, juice, or hard candies. Moderate to severe hypoglycemia requires assistance. If the patient can cooperate, provide oral glucose. If unresponsive, glucagon injection is necessary. Glucagon and D50W are medications used to treat severe hypoglycemia. Understanding their administration and potential side effects is crucial. Glucagon can cause nausea and vomiting, so patients must be placed on their side to avoid aspiration. D50W, given IV, works faster, but requires good IV access and careful monitoring to avoid complications like vein irritation. Morning hyperglycemia can be caused by the dawn phenomenon or the somogi phenomenon. Differentiating between these is key to proper management. The dawn phenomenon happens naturally. Around 2 to 8 a.m., the body releases hormones that make cells more resistant to insulin. The somogi phenomenon, on the other hand, results from nighttime hypoglycemia, triggering a rebound hyperglycemia. Nurses must assess nighttime blood sugars to distinguish the cause because the treatment is opposite. Dawn needs more insulin at night, somogi needs less. Diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, is a serious complication of type 1 diabetes. It's characterized by extreme hyperglycemia, dehydration, and ketone production. DKA develops fast, sometimes in just a few hours, if insulin levels drop too low. The body thinks it's starving, even though blood sugar is high, so it starts breaking down fat rapidly, producing acidic ketones that can lower the blood's pH dangerously. DKA results from a complex pathophysiology involving hyperglycemia, dehydration, electrolyte loss, and acidosis. Symptoms of DKA include flu-like symptoms, dehydration, cosmol breathing, and fruity breath. Acidosis can affect multiple body systems. Patients often present with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and confusion. Cosmol breathing, deep, rapid breaths. 
is the body's emergency response to blow off carbon dioxide and compensate for the acidic blood. The fruity breath odor comes from acetone, a type of ketone. DKA treatment involves assessing the patient's airway, LOC, hydration status, and electrolytes, administer fluids, insulin, and monitor for complications. Priorities include restoring blood volume with IV fluids, bringing down blood sugar with IV insulin, and carefully replacing lost potassium. Close monitoring in the ICU is usually necessary because insulin shifts potassium back into cells, which can dangerously lower serum potassium levels even more. Testing for ketones is important when blood sugar is high or during illness. Avoid exercise if ketones are present. Sick day rules are essential for preventing DKA. These include substituting carbohydrate liquids, continuing insulin, checking blood sugar frequently, and increasing fluid intake. Even if patients are not eating solid food, they must still take insulin because stress and illness drive blood sugar higher. Carb-containing fluids like broth or juice prevent starvation ketosis. Hydration and frequent glucose monitoring can catch problems early. Know when to call the doctor during sick days. This includes persistent hyperglycemia, moderate to large ketones, fever, or inability to take food or liquids. Let's consider a case study. A 23-year-old patient with type 1 diabetes presents with nausea, abdominal pain, and rapid breathing. What do you suspect is happening? The combination of symptoms, nausea, abdominal pain, deep rapid breathing, and the history of diabetes strongly points to DKA. Rapid assessment and treatment are essential to prevent worsening acid-base imbalance and potential coma. Why is the patient breathing so rapidly and deeply? The best response is that his serum pH is low, and this is a compensatory mechanism. This respiratory compensation, known as Kussmaul respirations, helps blow off excess acid in the form of carbon dioxide. It's the body's natural attempt to correct the dangerously low blood pH caused by ketone accumulation. A patient in the ICU for DKA management has a low potassium level. What assessment must be made before giving IV potassium? Ensure adequate urine output. Before giving potassium, always check that the kidneys are functioning. At least 30 mensal char of urine output is needed. If potassium is given while the kidneys are failing, it can accumulate rapidly, leading to fatal cardiac arrhythmias. What should the nurse teach the patient and his wife to prevent a recurrence? Focus on monitoring blood glucose, checking urine ketones, and reporting illnesses. Teaching patients how to manage sick days, when to adjust insulin, and when to seek medical help empowers them to prevent future DKA episodes. Family involvement is crucial because they can recognize early warning signs the patient may miss. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, and share this video to help others learn about caring for patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus.